Amen? Amen. All right. Very good. All right, well, uh, good evening, CR. Uh, it's great to be here with you tonight. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Trevor. I'm one of the pastors here at Community of Hope, and it's great to be here with you guys here Monday night. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Trevor, and I'm a codependent. Hi, Trevor. Hi, what's up, everybody? Good to be here with fellow strugglers and people figuring it out, right? Come on. Okay, great. All right, awesome. Anyway. <laughs> A little bit of honesty. Anyway, uh, so it's great to be here with everyone tonight. And uh, tonight I want to talk to you guys about exit ramps. That was perfect timing. I guess I have to bam, clap and more things will happen. Uh, We're going to be talking about exit ramps tonight. And I want to begin by talking about, I want you to think about a time in your life when you desperately wanted an exit ramp but couldn't find one. Okay? Maybe it was a time where you had to go to the bathroom so bad, and for the life of you, you could not find an exit ramp with a gas station. Or even worse, when you pull off on an exit ramp, you go and you see, oh, finally, a gas station, 20 miles to the left. Anybody ever done that one before? Yep, I have. Maybe you've been on a road trip and you need an exit ramp because you've had a three-year-old in the back of your car going, Daddy, I need to pee now. How many of you had dealt with that one? Great, yep. How many of you have done one where there's an older kid in the back of your car going, Mommy and Daddy, I think I'm going to throw up. I need an exit ramp. I want to tell you guys about the time when I desperately needed an exit ramp the most in my life. Um, I was, it was about 2014, and I had been living here for three months, and I was still getting used to Palm Beach County. I grew up in the Tampa Bay area. I lived in Tallahassee about eight years, and then I lived in Kentucky for four years. And, like, Kentucky just got electricity three weeks ago. So, you know, it's, you know, it's just different in Palm Beach County, Kentucky. I'm sorry. I love you. Love Trevor. Okay. Um, it's different. And so in Palm Beach County... And, you know, I was still learning the main thoroughways and the main roads, like there's Southern Boulevard, and then there's Okeechobee, and State Road 7, and I-95, and the Turnpike. I was still getting the lay of the land, and I was still figuring some stuff out. So I'd been living here for three months, and um, a cousin of mine who was living in Seattle at the time, and that's where I'm, most of my family's from is out in Seattle. Um, you should pray for them. Anyway, the... Um, I love living in South Florida. So anyway, they called me, they wanted me to go do the wedding and I was straight out of pastor school. I was making rookie moves left and right. And because I was new to this area, I was making rookie moves left and right. Leah and my son Kate had already flown out to Seattle earlier. We had an event here at Community Pup that Friday. And so when the event was over, I was taking a late flight out of Fort Lauderdale to go to Seattle, long flight. Well, um, I had a little bit of time. I didn't have a lot of time. But I had a little bit of time, and I'm like, you know what? I'm okay. I have a little bit of margin, but I think I'll be all right. I'm going to be fine. And so I drove down Okeechobee, and I went to go turn onto the turnpike right where the Chick-fil-A is. And the, that exit, I don't know why, and I don't know what's wrong with my brain, has always confused me. Always, always, always. Where I'm from, the exits are just a little bit more clear. And if you know what I'm talking about, if you go right, you're going what on that? North. If you go left, you're going what? My brain mixed those two things up. And so I went, having just a tiny bit of margin. I wasn't late, a tiny bit of margin. It's a Friday afternoon in Palm Beach County, y'all, in August. Like right now, it's probably like nine years ago this week. It actually is crazy. Oh my gosh, I just thought about it. It's nine years ago right now. I'm reliving this. It was nine years ago right now. And I went right instead of left and accidentally went north. Uh Uh-huh. Now... Rut row, exactly, rut row. Um, uh, In Tampa, where I'm from, and in other places where I've been, there's like an exit every 30 seconds on the road. And if you made a wrong turn, you get off, you go under the underpass, and you get back on and go the other way. No harm, no foul. Well, here, when when you get on the turnpike on Okeechobee, the next exit is like 10 miles north, just a little bit short of 10 miles. It's Beeline Highway. I drove through that in Friday afternoon, back to school traffic in Palm Beach County. I went 10 miles-ish north, only to finally find the one exit ramp to take that and make a U-turn and come all the way back. I never panicked so hard in a car ever in my life. And I made, guys, that little loop, that one little mistake because of no exit ramps, just had a Trevor and his own little happy 20-mile excursion only to go back right where I started. 
And now I'm in even deeper Friday afternoon traffic. And I start going south. And it's more traffic and more traffic. I'd never flown out of Fort Lauderdale's airport before. I'd never driven to Fort Lauderdale airport before. Everyone went, oh, our pastor's an idiot. Because I had never flown out of that airport before. I didn't know where parking was. I had to loop the airport twice to find the parking. Rookie move after rookie move after rookie move. And I thought I made it. I was going to be fine. My flight was delayed by two hours, so it's okay. Nope. Did you know? Did you know? That if you are one minute later than the 45-minute window of your original takeoff time, TSA will not let you in the airport. I missed my flight to Seattle. Now, it's okay. There's a happy ending at the end of all this. I found the very singular last flight out of Miami to Seattle, and I drove to Miami like I was from Miami. (laughs) My people. All right. And I made it all as well. I desperately, I will never forget, going, why is there not an exit ramp? And I wanted off that road to make a U-turn so bad. And that's what guilt can feel like, is it not? See, we're talking in the series Exit Ramp about getting off the guilt trip. And um, if you've ever struggled with guilt or shame, Oh my goodness, it could be all consuming and we often want to do anything we possibly can to get ourselves out from feeling this way. And this is one of the beautiful things that recovery offers is that it offers the love and the help and the grace of Jesus, particularly how we approach recovery here. We believe our higher power is Jesus Christ and the recovery process. He brings healing to our hearts and to our lives it can help get you off the never-ending, crushing weight of a guilt trip. God brings freedom. And so we're learning about that tonight. So particularly, we're focusing on steps 8 and 9 of the 12 steps. So why don't you guys read this out loud with me to your, together today. Step 8, ready, go. Make a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. We're going to get to that in a little bit. And then step 9. We may direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. That's important too. We're going to get back to that. And our scripture we're focusing on um, across this time where we're talking about the exit ramp steps eight and nine is just one passage from the Bible. Um, if you're new to it, it's from the New Testament. It's from a guy named Paul. And Paul really knew about guilt trips. Um, he had jacked up a lot in his life before he became a follower of Jesus and Jesus turned his whole world upside down for the good. Anyway, he writes this in Romans chapter 12, verse 18. This is what Paul said. And you can read this out loud together with me too. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. With everyone. Let's pray just for a moment. Let's pause and pray. So, um, God, we thank you that your presence is here with us tonight at recovery. And we thank you that you're the God of recovery. You're the God of freedom. You're the God who sets slaves free. You're the God who heals broken hearts. You're the God who heals broken lives. And we don't come here tonight because we've got it all together. We come here tonight um, to admit our brokenness to you going, we don't have it all together, but we believe that you can help put it all back together again. And so would you come and bring this healing grace uh, into our presence tonight. And we open our lives, even for the skeptic here tonight, even just a little bit, we open ourselves um, to what you might want to do in us and in our relationships and our lives. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, amen. 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 So let's talk about this for um, just a minute. I want to talk to you tonight about a super, super practical message Um, It's not going to be nebulous or spiritual or weird at all. I want to talk super practically with everybody tonight um, about how to say sorry. How to say sorry. Now, that might seem seem really basic to you. Um, It's not. um, It's not as much of a no-brainer as you think. We have to learn how to say sorry well. Um, how many of you are, have, are involved, whether, you, whether you're a teacher, you're part of the school system, or you have kids, or you have grandkids who went back to school this past week? Okay. Um, for those of you who um, aren't as familiar with that, maybe you don't, you're not in that stage right now, the first week back to school, everybody, is it wonderful or is it terrible? 
terrible, terrible. The kids are like having major problems, not eating all the sugar they wanted. They're tired. They're cranky. Every day is a meltdown. Oh my goodness, I came home today. God bless my family. I came home to a war zone before I came to recovery. And oh my goodness. And, um, and so when we have to teach our kids, like this is not naturally innate in human beings to know how to apologize. We teach our kids at our house how to say sorry. And they're not allowed to say to their sibling if they hit or bite or, you know, knock out in a UFC cage fight. I don't know whatever it was, was today. Um, they're not allowed to go, I'm sorry. No, no. Uh, uh, you, we have to teach our kids how to say sorry in the right way. And just because you get older doesn't mean you get good at this. Okay, right? Some people I know are allergic to saying sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm coming up. Hold on, hold on. I'm sorry. And they, they just can't get it out. Some people can't say it unless they've got attitude. Well, I'm sorry. How does that feel? Not very good, right? Some people say it with such indifference, like, I'm sorry. That doesn't help. That doesn't make anything better. Some people say sorry for things that they didn't even do, and they say it way too much. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the choices made. Codependence, where are my people at? Yes, right? Saying sorry for things that we didn't even do, right? We say sorry for uh, all sorts of different stuff, and sometimes we're just not good at this, and sometimes we need a little bit of help to get better at saying sorry. Now, I want to say something very clear here. Um, sorry is an important part of the recovery, po- in the recovery process of what's known as making amends. Sorry is not amends in and of itself, but it's a super important part of it. Here's why. You know why some of you might feel like you're struggling with guilt and shame? Well, some of you go, well, I, I'm not sure about this faith thing, but I'm open to hearing about it. I want to hear more about this Jesus guy. You talk about grace and forgiveness. That's cool. Okay, that's one level. But even for some of you who are already Christ followers and you're trying to find grace that's found in Jesus for your hurts and your habits and your hangups, um, you've already gone vertical asking God to forgive you for your hurts and your habits and your hangups and ways where you've contributed to the brokenness of your life. But there's something you still struggle with guilt and you don't know why. Because there's a horizontal component to your life. where so, It's one thing to ask God to forgive you, but it's another thing when we've offended and hurt other people in our lives by our choices and decisions and by lack of decisions that we've made. And it's the offended party that's still out there, but we're only doing this. Like, I keep asking God to forgive me, but I keep feeling guilty, and I don't know why. Well, this is partly why. Because you have to learn to make amends to people that you might have hurt if it's possible. Does that make sense? And what the teaching of Jesus offers to people is not only how to get right with God, but it's just basically this. It's also how to get right with other people. And that's the beautiful thing. So like, look at this verse that we were looking at earlier. Uh, back to, nope, uh, go back, thank you. Romans twelve eighteen. So he's saying, if it's possible, and sometimes it's not possible. So let me just put a couple asterisks on this. Sometimes it's not possible to do this with people, and you have to do a process of what's called making a living amends, and you might want to talk to your sponsor about that if you um, don't have a, if you have a sponsor. If you don't have a sponsor yet, find a sponsor, join a step study, you can learn about that. But um, if it's possible, you want to learn how to do this. And as far as it depends on you, and not all of it depends on you, and especially to my, my codependent people, what's up, I love you, um, not every apology is yours to make. Amen? Yeah, okay. So this is about keeping your side of the street clean. This is about owning your side of the street in a situation, in a relationship, in something you're dealing with. If it's possible, and if um, it's the right thing to do, it's not going to bring harm to someone else or another, and it's good and right to do, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, this is awesome. Live at peace with everyone. Y'all, the guy who wrote this, Paul, who I was just talking about, before he decided to become a follower of Jesus, he was busy killing other followers of Jesus. He was wiping them out. He would kill them. And he thought he was doing good. 
I'm not sure we know of any other better person to look at who was learning to make amends to people than Paul. It's funny, and I really mean it. This is the guy who said, live at peace with everybody. Because he took to heart the words of Jesus. Look at what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the best sermon, the best TED Talk ever given. If you like this stuff, go check it out. Anyway, Romans, uh, excuse me, Matthew chapter 5. This is my favorite chapter in the entire Bible. Matthew 5, verses 23 and 24. And Jesus said these words. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, so if you're at CR... If you're in a worship service, if you're trying to engage God in public worship, you're trying to grow in closeness with him. If you are offering your gift at the altar and they remember that your brother or sister has something against you, not that you have something against them and you need to forgive them. No, it's if you've done something. If your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them then come and offer your gift. This is where Paul is getting this at. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, do everything you can to live at peace with all people. And sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do, if you're trying to be a spiritual person and grow your faith, especially in a Christian context like this, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can possibly do is not raise your hands higher in worship, which that wouldn't hurt people if you worship a little bit more, you know, just might loosen up a little bit. Like, I'll try that. That's all you're getting out of me, bearded preacher. Um, that's not bad. That's good. But the most spiritual thing you could do is instead of putting your hands up, is to go pick up your phone and go make some phone calls and go mend some fences and heal some relationships. Jesus is saying here, that's the really spiritual thing. It's not just a vertical getting right with God. Jesus offers ways to help get right with other people. You tracking with me? Okay. So... Um, I want to give very two specific ways of how to, how to get better at saying sorry. And it's more than just saying sorry, but hang with me. Two ways to get better at saying I'm sorry for those of you who are allergic to it, for those of you who have struggled with the attitude of it, for those of you who overdo it, hang with me here. Here are two specific ways if you're taking notes that will help you in your process of making amends to people. The first one is that you want to get specific. You want to get specific with people. Um, like I was saying earlier with my kids, have you ever had somebody look at you and just go, I'm sorry? Did that help anything at all? No, it totally did not. It seems obvious, but it's not as obvious as it gets. When I was talking to you earlier about our kids and we have to teach our kids how to apologize, we give our kids a formula in our house that adults need this too. And when we're teaching this to our kids, my wife Leah and I are teaching it to ourselves too for what we do in our relationship with one another. And it's this here. You have to learn how to say, I'm sorry for, and you fill in the blank. So we had children in my house saying, I'm sorry for hitting you, biting, whatever. But when you're an adult, it's things like, I'm sorry for lying to you. I'm sorry for breaking your heart. I'm sorry for stealing from you. I'm sorry for, and just, you know, figure it out. Uh, the first way to get better at some of this verbal stuff with mending your relationships and making amends is you have, to, you have to learn how to first get specific with your sorry. You have to learn how to name it. Um. I'm part of a ministry here uh, that there's all sorts of different angles that God's grace wants to work in people's life. And recovery is a huge part of them. I'm part of another ministry at our church that um, called Freedom where we, we do, there's a good overlap with recovery and what that does. And one of the things that we say in that when we're talking about forgiveness, especially when we're learning to forgive other people for their offenses against us, is we say that general forgiveness does not heal a specific wound. Okay. So um, if I'm trying to forgive somebody else, me just saying, why well, forgive them? Well, I feel the same. It's because you have to learn how to get specific and name something in order to be able to forgive it. So it's the same reversed. A generic sorry doesn't heal specific wounds we may have caused. A nebulous apology leads to a nebulous sense of freedom from guilt. But a nuanced apology, 
a specific apology leads to a specific sense of freedom and forgiveness for yourself for the things that you have done. So you have to learn how to name it. When you learn to name things like this, guys, this is the fruit of making a fearless moral inventory, which is earlier on in the steps. When you have searched yourself and you've allowed God to search you and you've allowed people to speak into your life where you can make a specific, name it, the things that you may have done and the feelings that you may have done in your life. Not only for God to pour his grace on, but maybe just maybe for someone else to forgive you for too. Now, even if you haven't made it to step eight or nine, and you haven't done a fearless moral inventory yet, let me give you a little crash course for how you can apply this even now if you're not there in your recovery journey yet. Here's a little prayer that I pray every single day. I do this at nighttime, and I go ahead and put it up. I say three things. I say, God, search me. Part of the reason uh, we really stink at guilt trips is because um, we're terrible judges of ourselves. So show of hands, how many of you are... um, way too hard on yourselves at times, okay? Show of hands of, no, if you know yourself, you know you're way too easy on yourself sometimes. A couple of hands, okay, right? right? Okay, exactly. Everyone's personality is different. When you ask God to search you and God to be the judge of what's going on in my heart and my life, that means God's gonna get just right. He's not gonna be a heavy-handed um, guilt trip Lord from heaven and he's not going to be somebody who's going to let you off the hook. In love, he'll show you your junk. Is that in the Bible? I'm not sure. Yeah. God, show me my junk. So you say, God, search me. God, maybe today in general or maybe in this situation, show me where did I, not where did they, show me where did I miss the mark. And even another question that you could say that makes it even more personal and relational is, God, where did I grieve your heart here? And the Holy Spirit will always, always, always answer that question, and sometimes in ways that will surprise you. So um, pick a relationship that you have, and might, maybe it's a really serious one where you're working on figuring out amends of what to do there, great. Or maybe it's something that you had a riff with somebody today. They just need to go, God, search me. Where did I, where did I miss it, and where did I grieve you today? What's my side of the street with this? That's what's healed a lot of fights I've had in my marriage is after I've prayed that the next morning, hey, I'm sorry for the way I said this word. And that was the exact thing my wife needed to hear instead of me trying to figure it out and apologize for 10 things or to feel like I didn't have to apologize for anything. I let God search me. Make sense? Okay, so you want to get specific. Here's the second thing. Uh, You want to get sincere. First, you have to get specific and then you have to get sincere. And I just want to be really, really clear here. This is not about how to turn on the tears. Anybody good at fake crying when you need something? Don't show your hands for that one. (laughs) This is not about manipulation. This is not about um, manufacturing emotion. This isn't about passion and zeal and really, I'm going to say it like I mean it. It's not that. It's way, way more than that. What does it mean to get sincere? It means three things. It means first, you have empathy for how your behavior may have impacted another person. Um, If you're willing to listen to other people and for how our, our poor choices may have hurt them, if we could put ourselves in their shoes, go, ah, I'm sorry about that. Then it turns it from instead of you saying, well, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm, I'm just going to say, I'm sorry, I'm a piece of crap. You know I mean? it's, that's still about you. You hear me? If you learn to have empathy when getting sincere with somebody, it's, it's not, I'm sorry for how terrible I am. It's, I'm sorry for what I did and how that made you feel. It's not about you. You get focused on other people. And that's where you learn to take responsibility. If you're sincere, if you have empathy for how we've treated other people, and then you take responsibility for how you treat other people. I gave you my little formula for how to say sorry. Here's how you add to it. It goes, I'm sorry for, 
and how it made you feel, not how I'm so crappy, how it made you feel and fill in the blank because you've had empathy for what that, how that impacted them. It's getting your eyes off yourself even in apologizing. It's how it made them feel, and you're taking responsibility for this. And even here, even if you disagree with somebody with how they feel, you don't need to go, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. That's called a backhanded apology, and that's a bad sorry. It's even better. If I were to change this, this is, this is exactly how I sent it to him. I would change it, though, looking at this, and how I made you feel that way. Even if that wasn't my intent, what I did made you feel that way. I'm sorry. See what I mean? And here's the last thing. We're going to close with this. You need to have empathy, responsibility, and then there's this biblical word called restitution. Everyone say restitution. No. Restitution is not a legal term in the American court systems. Can be, but just hear me out. Restitution is the biblical word for amends. The Bible is the one that came up with the idea of amends in the first place. I'm, most of you probably never seen this verse here before. This is Numbers chapter 5. I'm going to read this and you share a story and we're going to close. Number, Numbers chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Say to the Israelites, this is God speaking to Moses, any man or woman who wrongs another in any way and so is unfaithful to the Lord is guilty and must confess the sin they have committed. Great, they're learning how to say sorry. Verse 7. They must make full restitution for the wrong they have done and add a fifth of the value to it and give it all to the person they have wronged. So let's say you accidentally kill somebody's ox. We're in Loxahatchee. I don't know if anybody has ox or not. <laughs> um, you kill somebody's ox on accident. We need to say sorry for it and then you replace the ox, but you find an ox that's 20% better than the ox that they had. Or you accidentally, um, you accidentally, I don't know. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> the point is, now notice this here. Go back to the formula, next slide. I'm sorry for what I did specifically and how it made you feel and you have empathy and responsibility. And this is where it begins to take amends. And how can I make it right? And sometimes you need to figure this out before. You don't need to put the burden of this on the other person. And sometimes you do need to ask them for input. I want to make it right. How can I help make it right? Let me tell you guys a story about a guitar. I'm going to grab Larry. Which one's yours, left or right? Left. Great, cool. Um, I can't play guitar, thank God. <laughs> and uh, um, I want to tell you guys a story about a guitar. And um, I was at Florida State. I think I might have told this a couple of years ago here at Celebrate Recovery, but it's perfect for night two anyway. Um, I, I was trying to learn how to play guitar, and I failed, but I was trying. And um, I, I was living at Florida State, and I was living at a campus ministry where several, like six, seven guys were living in one apartment together. And we were working together, helping lead FSU students to know the, this awesome Jesus that we're talking about. And I borrowed my friend's guitar. And it was in my room. And uh, I was up against the wall. I didn't have a guitar stand. And I wasn't there when this happened. And I don't know who did it. And nobody owned up to it. But somehow, someway, because we had college kids in our apartment all the time, it was up against a wall like this. And somebody hit it. And this part completely broke off, completely splintered, strings everywhere. And my friend was walking through um, my apartment and saw his guitar shattered, laying on the floor of my room. And his only impression was, they broke my guitar, didn't even feel like I deserve the respect to be told that they broke it, and they're just going to leave it in a pile. These people don't care about me at all, and nobody respects me. And he didn't say anything to anybody. It was his fiance who pulled me aside and said, hey, he's, Eric is really hurt. You guys broke his guitar. He said nothing. Like, I didn't even know. I hadn't even been in my room yet. It had just happened. And so she was kind enough to let me know, hey, you guys might want to do something. Well, um, in the church we were at, our pastor had just read about Moses and Ox and 20% better and all that stuff and told us about how to make relationships better. 
And so we gathered together and scraped together a bunch of college kids' money. I took the guitar to a music store and said, can you fix this? And they said, this is a piece of junk. We can't fix it. Well, can you find me a piece of junk that's 20% better? (laughs) And they did. And we scraped together enough money and bought him a new guitar. And I walked into his office like this. Let's see here. Without breaking Larry's guitar. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I walked it to, don't worry, I'll buy you 20, one 20% better. Okay. Um, I, I walked into my friend's office and I was like, hey, can I talk to you? And he blew me off because he was still so mad at me. He kept me waiting, standing in his doorway for 10 minutes while he was on the phone with somebody. And they said, what do you want? I said, hey, um, I, want, I want to talk to you. And um, I came and sat down. I was like, listen, um, I found your guitar broken in my room. I didn't break it. I don't know who did. I'm really sorry that we did not take good enough care of your guitar that it got broken. And I didn't break it, but it's my fault it did because it was in my room. And I'm sorry. Um, That's my fault. And um, I bet it probably made you feel disrespected and nobody cares about you or your stuff. And um, I'm sorry we made you feel that way. That's not true. We actually do love you and respect you. And um, we tried to fix your old guitar, and we couldn't. Um, But the guitar place I took it to said, this one's even better than the one you had before. I'm so sorry. Would you forgive us? He held his guitar. Instead of cussing me out, he looked at me and said, I don't deserve this. And I said, yes, you do. You do deserve this. And it was the one time in my life, you know how every friend group has the loud mouth? It was the one time he was speechless. And I gave him a hug and I left. And it fixed our friendship. I'm not the master at this. I I just know this works. And I didn't invent it. But I can help point the way to go. This is how we do better at saying sorry. It's more than just saying it. It's an important part of how we make amends and get right with others. Amen. 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 So, um, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for how you're leading all of us into the journey of recovery and healing. I pray you would help me do better and help me get right with people I need to get right with. And I pray you would help my friends here at CR uh, at Recovery to get right with people we need to get right with and to make amends uh, that we'd be willing to and that we would do so when it's possible and that wouldn't be a harm to others. Help us, God. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. amen.